it's May 1915, and you're standing on the deck of the RMS Lusitania, hoping to catch your first sight of land. It's a bright, sunny day. There's a taste of sea salt in the air. Beneath your feet, you can feel the enormous ocean liner's engines powering away. After a week on the ocean, you've almost reached your destination, Liverpool, England. But it's been a tense voyage. You can't wait to set foot on solid ground. You've tried not to act nervous. You just got married at a big society wedding, and your newlywed husband has told you not to worry. The two of you decided to go on your honeymoon in England, a week at the Savoy Hotel in London, then the Cotswolds, even though Germany and England are at war. Before you left, you even read an ominous ad the German embassy ran in the New York Times, warning you and your fellow travelers that you could be a target for the U-boats. Notice, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain. Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain are liable to destruction and do so at their own risk. That didn't stop you or many other people, though. Your husband assured you Germany's U-boats aren't powerful enough to sink a big cruiser like the Lusitania. It's the largest passenger ship in the world, and the Lusitania is fast. So fast, it can cross the Atlantic in four days under good conditions. The captain assures everyone that the Lusitania is too fast for the German submarines to even catch. And it probably would have been, except the captain slows the boat to save coal. And that's when the torpedo hits. The Lusitania sank in just 18 minutes. Nearly 1,200 passengers perished at sea. In England, people were shocked and horrified and propelled to action. Many enlisted in the army the moment they heard the news. 128 Americans were among the dead. And since the ship had set sail from New York, some here felt Germany had personally attacked the United States. But Americans couldn't agree whether to join England or not in the war against Germany. Many sided with President Woodrow Wilson that there was no upside in getting involved in a foreign conflict. Others in the United States were itching for war. The New York Herald printed the headline, What a pity Theodore Roosevelt is not president. Roosevelt, the ex-president, felt it was America's duty to meet this aggression with swift military action. It took nearly two years after the sinking of the Lusitania for the United States to finally declare war against Germany, but anti-German sentiment grew much more quickly. Schools canceled German language classes. Germantown, Nebraska renamed itself Garland. German taverns and saloons came up with new, more English-sounding names overnight. Chicago's Bismarck Hotel, for example, became the Randolph. By 1918, even sauerkraut would be renamed Liberty Cabbage. And beer, served in every saloon, tavern, and bar in America, would not escape the rising anti-German sentiment. Not a change of name, there was no freedom mail or American draft. Instead, with the help of the Anti-Saloon League, beer became a symbol of an enemy within. Loyal citizens had a duty to defend the country against brewers helping the pro-German alliance at least according to the Anti-Saloon League. Its leaders had called for investigations into the breweries owned by alien enemies. The fight for prohibition had become part of the war effort. If you like this podcast, you're probably looking for other great history podcasts to listen to. Wondery, the network behind this show, has other podcasts for you, especially if you love the way we tell stories here on American History Tellers. Great shows like Tides of History and Fall of Rome are fantastic trips back in time that give you a, a visceral feel for what life in those times might have been. And if more modern history is your thing, I'm going to go ahead and recommend my first podcast with Wondery, the political thriller Terms. It's a scripted audio drama, but is it fictional? Just head to apple.co slash Wondery. That's apple.co slash Wondery. Or if you're on an Android, just head to Wondery.fm. From Wondery, this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. I'm Lindsey Graham. We're continuing American History Tellers with a six-episode series about prohibition. This is part two, Drying Out. Last episode, we learned how a rising feeling of anxiety over the nation changing drew Americans to support the idea of temperance. 
But how did this popular support lead to the passing of a constitutional amendment? After all, it is not easy to pass one. Only 27 amendments have been passed in our entire history. And either a two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress or a two-thirds majority vote from all state legislatures is required. For prohibition, it actually started with a different amendment altogether that passed just a few years earlier. In 1913, the 16th Amendment was passed, which allowed the government to start collecting income tax from its citizens for the first time. The anti-alcohol forces believed this amendment would allow the government to operate without the revenue they were used to receiving from lucrative alcohol taxes. Now, the Anti-Saloon League saw a path to a constitutional amendment banning alcohol, and they began their push. An amendment would make the ban on alcohol as permanent and wide-reaching as possible. After all, no amendment, once it had been ratified, had ever been repealed. The League and its broad coalition of allies had worked for years to lay the groundwork. The same year the income tax amendment passed, there was the Webb-Kenyon Act, which made it illegal to transport liquor across state lines. The 1916 election was another victory. The Anti-Saloon League had successfully backed individual candidates across the country, transforming Congress into a legislative body that was two-thirds in favor of the nation going dry. Then, with the declaration of war against Germany in April 1917, the popular tides turned in favor of prohibition. The 18th Amendment was passed on January 16, 1919, when Nebraska became the 38th state to vote in favor of it. One year later to the day, the manufacturer sale or transportation of intoxicating liquors was banned. On that day, prohibition was the law of the land. Imagine it's a chilly January day in 1920. You're a young boy in Norfolk, Virginia, and like most Friday mornings, you're getting ready to go to school. As you pack up your books, your mother tells you that today, you're going to a parade instead. Make sure to wear your good black coat. It's freezing. You walk hand-in-hand hand with your mother towards the train station. As you get closer, you see a huge crowd of people. Everyone's dressed in black, and at the center, a giant coffin. It must be a funeral, but the people don't look sad. They look happy, almost like they're celebrating. Pallbearers start marching the coffin towards the meeting hall. They're being followed by a man in a devil mask, skulking behind the coffin. It's Satan, and he's going to his grave too. You squint your eyes to see who's leading the procession. It's Billy Sunday the famous preacher. He's here to bury John Barleycorn in that coffin. It's 20 feet long to hold all the sin and disease and heartbreak that John Barleycorn used to bring. Who's John Barleycorn? Alcohol, wine, beer, and whiskey. We won't have it anymore, thank goodness, because of prohibition. The crowd starts singing, glory, glory, hallelujah. John Barleycorn's body goes into the grave. Billy Sunday turns to the crowd, speaking a mile a minute. Slums will disappear, men will walk upright again, women will smile, and children will laugh again. But he says one more thing that makes you wonder. He promises he'll keep fighting. You don't know why he'd have to. John Barleycorn's already dead, right? Norfolk, Virginia really did hold a funeral for John Barleycorn on January 16, 1920. 10,000 people turned up to hear the Reverend Billy Sunday speak and watch vice and legal alcohol head to the grave. Norfolk celebration wasn't the only one. Mock funerals were held for John Barleycorn all across the country. But not every funeral was joyful. At bars and hotels across America that Friday night, the mood was somewhere between sadness and disbelief. Some bars hung black decor and brought in their own fake caskets so that customers could pay respects. Others stayed open until every last drop was gone. The Vanderbilt Hotel in New York went through a hundred cases of champagne as the band played Goodbye Forever. But once saloon goers had shook off that historic hangover, they began looking for alcohol-free amusements the newly dry country had to offer. Right away, instead of booze, America discovered its sweet tooth. A soda pop or an ice cream sundae at the local soda fountain replaced a long night at the bar. Soft drinks weren't new, of course. Ginger ale, root beer, and cola had been around for years, sold as temperance drinks and health tonics for people with ailments like upset stomach. But now the demand for these sugary drinks really took off. Five years after Prohibition, soda sales had multiplied 25 times over. Ice cream sales boomed too. Behind the counter, soda jerks showed off their creative skills, mixing up ice cream sodas, egg creams, malts, and sundaes. And for entertainment, soda fountains installed the country's first radios, which were too expensive for the typical family to own at home. Gathered at the soda fountain, 
They could listen to soap operas, music hours, mystery stories, and vaudeville comedy acts. It's a Friday night. Imagine you're off to the soda fountain with your old drinking buddy. You slide onto the stool. You order a, a root beer float. He orders an egg cream. At 9 p.m., your favorite show comes on. Now, let us take you over 3,000 miles of distance to the heart of the frozen north, to Clicquot Club, the nightclub of Eskimo Land. Hello, everybody. The barking dogs and carefree Eskimos of the far north welcome you once again to Clicquot Club, the one bright spot in Eskimo Land. All the Eskimos for miles around are here tonight to enjoy Harry Reznor's sparkling banjo rhythms, to dance and make merry, and to refresh themselves with that sparkling mellow drink, Clicquot Club, America's own fine ginger ale. So here we go, off to a bright start with a happy song. You and your drinking buddy strike up a conversation with the soda jerk. We talk about the new massive Yankee ballpark they're building in New York and whether they'll ever be able to fill all the seats. You're having so much fun, you almost don't mind. Your root beer float will never give you a buzz. After finishing your ice cream soda, the two of you might have chosen to take in a motion picture. Theaters build themselves as wholesome alternatives to the saloon. In the early days of cinema, old temperance plays like Ten Nights in a Bar Room were turned into movies. But as movie theaters gained popularity in the 20s, the industry invested in better technology, eventually leading to talking pictures and animated films. The 1920s also kicked off a golden age of sports. People took up golf, tennis became incredibly popular, and baseball officially came to be known as America's national pastime. Thanks in no small part to the radio broadcasts. Fans could actually hear the play-by-play -play on the radio and not just read about the games the next day in the paper. It's 1921. You're a young baseball fan in Pittsburgh. Your dad has been reading you the ball scores from newspapers all summer long. It's August 5th, and the Pirates are having a great summer, even leading the mighty New York Giants, the whole National League, in fact. Your dad's taking you to the soda shop for a Sunday. Hey, Dad, after this, can we have a catch? Well, sure, if you want to, but uh, let's see what's on the radio first. Your dad winks at the owner, who starts fiddling with the receiver. After a moment of static, you hear a voice, and the sound of a ball hitting a bat. It's the game. Dad, how is this possible? How can we hear this? They're at the park right now. They've rigged up some microphone. I cannot believe this. That ball game, the Pirates versus the Phillies, was the first baseball game ever broadcast on the radio. Americans tried all kinds of fads. Badminton, competitive swimming, fence pole sitting, crossword puzzle tournaments, dance competitions. Dance crazes came and went. The Foxtrot, the Charleston, the Lindy Hop, the Jitterbug. Maybe the preacher Billy Sunday was right. Maybe it was the dawn of a new era. The saloon was gone and Americans were finding new ways to pass the time. But from the beginning, cracks were already forming in Prohibition's wholesome facade. Big problems were showing up in an unlikely place the doctor's office. American History Tellers is sponsored by Squarespace. Carrie Nation had a message to share with the country. Drinking was a sin, but she became notorious only for her methods, throwing rocks and swinging hatchets. Her attacks on saloons made headlines, but they didn't get much done. Don't let the medium become the message. These days, if you have something to share with the country or the world, you need a great website. One that communicates your story without the distractions of coding, design, maintenance, or enormous cost. Squarespace can help. You'll get beautiful, ready-to-go templates from world-class designers, powerful e-commerce functionality to sell anything, all customizable to your brand, your mission, with just a few clicks. So put down your rocks and hatchets, Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support American History Tellers and you want to hear more shows like it, then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code TELLERS to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code TELLERS. Did you know that the average American family visits five totally different websites before booking a vacation rental? You can spend less time planning your next trip and more time relaxing with Tripping.com, the world's number one site for vacation rentals. Tripping.com is trusted by millions of travelers and featured by the New York Times, Travel and Leisure, Forbes, and more. Whether you're looking for a cabin to get away to this weekend or already looking ahead to vacations this spring, Tripping.com can help you find the perfect place to stay. 
Vacation rentals offer flexibility, perks, and amenities that hotels don't, like multiple bedrooms, backyards, hot tubs, free Wi-Fi, and even fully stocked kitchens so you can plan and cook your own meals. With Tripping.com, OneSearch lets you filter, compare, and sort over 10 million available properties on trusted sites like VRBO, TripAdvisor, Booking.com, and more. So don't wonder if you're getting the best deal. You'll save an average of 18% per night by booking your vacation with Tripping.com. So don't forget, if you want to save time and money while booking the perfect vacation rental for your next trip, head to Tripping.com slash Tellers today. That's T R I P. P-I-N-G dot com slash tellers. Tripping dot com slash tellers. Imagine it's the fall of 1920. You live in Cleveland and just after summer ended, you caught a nasty cold. After weeks of coughing, you're worried you might have to miss work. So you go to the doctor. The waiting room is packed. Some people are coughing worse than you, but others just look annoyed that the wait is so long. The doctor finally calls you in. What seems to be the problem? I have a terrible cough at night. Can't sleep. Any sharp pains in the chest? Yes. <coughs> terrible. Have you been taking any alcohol for it? No, sir. I, I don't have any liquor at home. Well, that's a shame. I've always maintained that every family ought to have an alcohol stimulant in the house at all times. Well, yes, sir, but, but nobody has any. There's nothing more valuable in an emergency. Really? Yes, I use it myself. I find it braces me up. But you can't buy alcohol anymore. Oh, you can if you're sick. And I think you might have walking pneumonia. Best thing for it is a shot or two of whiskey every night before bed. I'll write your prescription. You can take it over to the pharmacist. That's right. You could go to the hospital with a legitimate illness and leave with a prescription for what doctors called medicinal liquor. Or you could feel completely healthy, go to the doctor, and fake your way through an illness until you had a little piece of paper to take to the pharmacy to buy some booze. Was the doctor really fooled? No, probably not. But in the first few months of Prohibition, 15,000 doctors applied for permits to prescribe alcohol. It was good business for the pharmacies filling the prescriptions, too. Hundreds of new drugstores opened in major cities across the country. In 1919, the Chicago-based company Walgreens had 20 stores, but by the end of Prohibition, it had opened nearly 600. Alcohol had been a panacea throughout history for everything from stomach problems to gout. But now, going to the doctor's office took on a whole new meaning. There was even a song called Oh Doctor, which showed that the whole scheme was kind of an open secret. It went, Most everybody you meet nowadays seems to be feeling so blue. They say it's an imposition to enforce this prohibition, and I think so too. But Congress has given doctors the power to hand out the brandy and rye. And now in their office at most any hour, you're bound to hear somebody cry. Doctors could even prescribe beer, even if beer's alleged health effects were less than obvious. It was a controversial practice, but the Justice Department allowed it, which made Wayne Wheeler and his Anti-Saloon League furious. So what was the Anti-Saloon League up to now that Prohibition had passed? They'd already won the war, right? They've gotten the saloon shuttered and put old John Barleycorn six feet under. Yes and no. Wheeler understood pretty quickly that what the law said was one thing, while making sure it was enforced was entirely another. This loophole where doctors could prescribe booze turned out to be the League's next crusade. Wheeler and his anti-saloon League pressured Congress to clamp down on medicinal alcohol, and it worked. In 1921, Congress passed the Wills-Campbell Act, which banned the practice of prescribing beer and limited the amount of liquor doctors could prescribe to half pint per patient every 10 days. The Anti-Saloon League tried to get them to ban all medicinal liquor, but that effort was met with fierce opposition from doctors. But why? It wasn't just that doctors made a lot of money off liquor prescriptions, which they did. It was also that doctors didn't want the government to tell them how they should practice medicine. There were other ways to find alcohol legally, too. Possession of alcohol was never actually against the law. It was making or selling it that was illegal. So long as you said those bottles were in your cellar before Prohibition took effect on January 16, 1920, you were not breaking any laws. So anybody who could afford to stock up before the country went dry did. J.P. Morgan, the legendary banker, bought a thousand cases of champagne to weather the impending dry spell. The newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst had a legendary wine cellar stuffed with the finest wine and spirits. Even President Woodrow Wilson kept his own personal supply in the White House, which he took with him when he left office in 1921. 
and that cleared the way for the incoming president, Warren G. Harding, to arrive with his own stash. California wineries, forced to hold everything-must-go sales, sold more than 140 million bottles of wine to private collectors the year before Prohibition took effect. As supplies dwindled and alcohol grew more scarce, prices skyrocketed. Before, you could buy a quart of beer for 10 cents. Now the same beer would run you 80 cents as contraband. Gin and whiskey prices went up even more, assuming you could find it. In those early years of Prohibition, it was not easy to track down illegal booze. But despite the drunken parties, moonshiners, speakeasies, and bootleggers, all the things we now associate with Prohibition, people were drinking less, not more. Because everything was happening under the table, there aren't any official sales figures to look at. But historians have found another way to guess how much drinking was actually happening. By looking at police reports and doctor's records. Drunk and disorderly charges dropped in half. Cirrhosis and liver failure fell substantially. So did alcohol-related psychoses. By historians' best estimates, Americans were drinking a third less what they drank before Prohibition. By 1922, private sellers were going bare. And after the passage of the Wills-Campbell Law, doctors couldn't prescribe as much medicinal alcohol. So some folks did what Americans had always done when they see a gap in the marketplace. They turn it into a business. A black market of illegally imported booze quickly took shape. And the people who ran it, these were bootleggers. After Prohibition became law, bootleggers started springing up everywhere. Smugglers bringing in alcohol from other countries and thieves who stole medicinal alcohol and sold it on the black market. Bootleggers came up with thousands of creative ways to hide, transport, and sell alcohol. Some built false bottom suitcases and trunks. Others paid cops to look the other way. Even the word bootlegger comes from an old smuggling trick soldiers used before Prohibition to hide flasks of alcohol in their boots. By 1922, the bootlegging business was booming. Cases of scotch were running 150 bucks each. Everybody wanted liquor. Some of it was high quality, smuggled in from overseas, but there was also cheaper, counterfeit alcohol on the market. A two-tiered black market developed, high-end for the rich clientele and cheaper prices for the regular customers. But this cheaper alcohol made some people nervous, and with good reason, because not everyone was selling the good stuff. What they were selling, well, some of it could kill you. American History Tellers is sponsored by Sleep Number. Maybe you've considered a Sleep Number bed, but thought you couldn't afford one. I know for sure one thing no one can afford is a restless night. Sleep Number has great news. Right now, during their Ultimate Sleep Number event, you can save 50% on their Ultimate Limited Edition bed. The Sleep Number bed lets you choose your ideal comfort on each side, so it's the perfect bed for couples. Their newest beds are so smart, they actually sense your every move and automatically adjust, so you stay sleeping comfortably throughout the night. They even have an adjustment for snoring. Does your bed do that? Sleep Number beds cost about the same as a traditional mattress, last twice as long, and 9 out of 10 owners recommend them. Come in during their Ultimate Sleep Number event and save 50% on an Ultimate Limited Edition bed. Queen mattresses start at only $699.99. Sleep Number now has over 550 stores nationwide. Find the one nearest you at sleepnumber.com. The quality of bootleg liquor was an issue almost right away. Every city had seen major outbreaks of alcohol poisoning. Fatalities were usually at their worst around the holidays. Poison hooch typically came from a few different sources. One was from people who tried to make alcohol to sell out of whatever they could find, from paint thinner to shoe polish. The second was when people made it the old-fashioned way, in small pot stills from grain or sugar. The people who operated stills usually taught themselves how to do it, and not always with the safest results. You've probably heard of these folks referred to as moonshiners. There's a certain romance associated with moonshine. American entrepreneurship, hiding stills in the woods, running whiskey in souped-up cars, but moonshiners had been around a long time, since before Prohibition, back when the government put a tax on whiskey in 1791. But with the banning of alcohol, many Americans turned to moonshine as the answer. Some moonshiners toiled over a single still buried in the countryside, while others ran major operations. 
But even those big operations, the ones who could truck their spoils from rural southern towns into Nashville, the big southern distribution hub, were still largely run by novice distillers who'd never made alcohol before. Operating a still is fairly simple. You put corn or wheat, and hopefully not shoe polish or paint thinner, into the bottom of a still and let it ferment for a few days. Then you light a fire underneath. Just like boiling water turns into steam, boiling a fermented mixture creates alcoholic steam. The steam collects and condenses into pure, drinkable alcohol, if you do it right. But often, the first stuff that came off of the still was actually poison. It boiled at a lower temperature than the alcohol. So distinguishing poison from drinkable alcohol took time and experience. And more often than not, several batches would get shipped off for sale before the novice distiller really got the process down pat. In many ways, knowing where your alcohol came from was a matter of life and death. And if you had the money and really knew the scene, you didn't touch the mediocre swill made at home. You wanted the good stuff from abroad, or you traveled abroad to get it. On the first 4th of July after Prohibition took effect, more than 50,000 people crossed the border to Tijuana, Mexico to celebrate by drinking. Tourists flocked to towns like Ensenada, Monterey, and Tijuana. They walked down streets under the hot summer sun, past hotels and public houses, to duck into casinos and bars to get out of the heat, many of which were owned by and operated for Americans. Tijuana quickly became a favorite for Californians. Cool breezes rolled in off the Pacific, and men and women spent long summer evenings sipping cocktails and smoking on rooftop patios. Where the night took them did not matter. A little gambling or drinking was always on the menu, because in Mexico, all of it was legal. The nation fell in love with going abroad, and the alco-tourism industry thrived. Even in Canadian towns, where the rules were a bit stricter, Canada didn't have a national prohibition like the U.S. did, but many provinces chose to remain dry after the First World War. Legal alcohol was still available in Quebec, Manitoba, and British Columbia, and soon other Canadian provinces followed. Half of the country was wet again by the mid-1920s. Border town roadhouses and taverns popped up immediately and thrived. One Canadian poem was certainly inspired by the neighbors to the south. Four and twenty Yankees, feeling very dry, went across the border to get a drink of rye. When the rye was open, the Yanks began to sing, God bless America, but God save the king. And even if you were nowhere near the Canadian or Mexican borders, there were always international waters. It wasn't long before scrappy tour guides invented the first booze cruises, which brought thirsty Americans to places like the Bahamas, Bimini, and... Just 90 miles from Key West, Havana would become a very successful destination for a little dancing, gambling, and rum. And of course, wherever you went, you could bring home a souvenir or two or three. It wasn't legal to bring liquor home, but most people couldn't resist, and sometimes in staggering quantities. Since alcohol from overseas was the most valuable, the most successful bootleggers were not selling moonshine made by amateurs in the countryside. They were illegally bringing in top-shelf stuff any way they could. And no one transformed the bootlegging industry more than Captain Bill McCoy. McCoy was a Daytona Beach boatyard owner who had fallen on hard times. Although not a drinker himself, he saw that Prohibition was a big opportunity for someone who could captain a boat. So in 1921, he invested every last penny into a 90-foot schooner, the Henry L. Marshall, and set off for Nassau, capital of the Bahamas. Once there, he bought 1,500 cases of whiskey, loaded it onto the boat, and delivered it to Georgia, selling them for a $15,000 profit. That's about $200,000 in today's money on his first trip. McCoy's first foray into smuggling was a smashing success. The entrepreneurial spirit took hold of McCoy, who started to think of ways to maximize his profits. His eureka moment came when he realized two islands off the coast of Canada, St. Pierre and Miquelon, were actually still considered part of France. Most of Canada was, as we said, under its own prohibition, but France never had one, so producers from all over Europe could legally ship to St. Pierre and Miquelon. 
Anyone with a good boat could buy practically anything they wanted and then run it down the coast to the Jersey Shore. So McCoy bought more and bigger ships. But how do you get a big ship capable of carrying thousands of cases of liquor to shore without being caught by the Coast Guard? McCoy came up with an answer for that, too. Instead of unloading on shore, he just sailed the boats to an imaginary line three miles off the coast where American law ended and international waters started. Smaller boats, manned by bootleggers, sailed out to meet him, bought the booze, and smuggled it into America. Best of all, the two islands were close to New York and other large cities in the Northeast, cities where alcohol was in high demand and people had the money to pay for expensive champagne and scotch whiskey. McCoy was one of many entrepreneurs who came to be known as rum runners. But there was never as much rum involved as there was whiskey and wine. The liquor McCoy brought in became the gold standard of illicit alcohol. He liked to think of himself as an honest smuggler. His booze was legit. It was uncut. The real McCoy? Yeah, some people would have called it that, though that's not actually the origin of that phrase. Let's go back to the beginning of the previous episode. We described a waiter in Manhattan in 1920 who had just been approached to connect his wealthy clientele with a supplier of illicit booze. Imagine you're that same waiter again, but now it's 1922, a couple of years into Prohibition. You've worked your way up the bootlegging supply chain. You're tired of being an errand boy for the local importer. So when you hear about this pipeline of high-quality French booze that McCoy has created, you want in. You get a tip that a man named Wolfsheim has an office in Times Square. He's high up enough to connect you with McCoy. Yeah, come in. Uh, hello. Nice to meet you, sir. Can I have a few minutes of your time? I have a business proposition for you regarding some goods I've seen of yours over in a garage in Brooklyn. I met your man over there. For Christ's sake, shut the door. Yeah, he told me you'd be by. But with all due respect, I've never heard of you. I don't do business with strangers. Wait, give me a second. We're not really strangers. We have a friend in common, Mr. Spencer. He's a customer of mine. Oh, you know Spencer, huh? Yes. So please, give me a moment. I can make it worth your while. You see, I have what's called a supply problem. I've got more clients than I can serve. You want me to help you? Yes, to get the good stuff. The stuff McCoy's bringing in through Jersey. That's what my clients want. I see. Well, I need a $1,000 partnership fee to even get started. You were warned about this. You pull out the money and hand it over. Wolfsheim thumbs through the cash approvingly. I see you're prepared. I think we're going to get along fine. I'll set up a meeting for next week. And with that, you've taken your first step towards a bootlegging empire. A lot of money would come from this partnership. Your life is about to change. And with over a million gallons of booze making its way down to Rum Row every year, there would be finally enough alcohol to bring back drinking establishments. Not the saloon, but something pretty close. It would become known as the Speakeasy. I hope you enjoyed our second episode of Prohibition. If you did, please do give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, NPR One, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support this show by supporting them. And thank you. American History Tellers is hosted, sound designed, and edited by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship, with additional production assistance from Derek Barrons. This episode is written by Christine Sismondo, PhD. Executive producers Marshall Louis, Ben Adair, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.